joining us today. I'm Stephanie Meeks. I'm a regulatory manager at Pacificorp, and um, we're excited to have you here today. We're going to have quite a lot of information to cover. We're joining um, two presentations together to um, discuss our clean energy implementation plan um, and the demand side management workshop too as well. So I'm um, excited. We have a lot of content to cover. Um, so we'll get things moving along right away. So with that, I will pass it over to our facilitator today, Morgan Westbury. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you everybody else for joining us today. We're very excited to have our inaugural Clean Energy Implementation Plan engagement series and uh, including the demand side management workshop. Um, for a better meeting experience, we want to let you all know this will be recorded to increase accessibility to the information that's shared. Um, so that information will be posted online after it is uploaded and reviewed. Um, we also provide Spanish and ASL interpretations. So if you would like to use one of those options, you can simply go down to the navigation or navigate to the interpretation button um, and select the mode of communication you would like to utilize. Um, for any technical support, you can feel free to chat tag directly um, and he will be able to help you overcome any of those issues you may be experiencing. Uh, lastly, we do welcome questions throughout, so feel free to raise your hand or drop a question in the chat. We will be monitoring it and um, be sure to address it at uh, a fitting time within the presentation. Um, as you see, we have a pretty robust agenda for you today. Um, from overview to engagement and um, on the savings targets later in the second half. Also worth noting, that we will be starting the demand side management workshop at that time at two o'clock regardless. Next slide. Well, and I guess before doing this, would also love to invite all of our participants to introduce themselves via chat uh, to really help create that dialogue. Uh, so anybody that's comfortable introducing themselves and their organization uh, would love, love to hear who we have in the crowd. Um, as you see, the objective today is to really create that dialogue on the CEIP and provide expanded learning opportunities. Uh, that, that's why it's recorded. We want this information to be um, as available as possible and as accessible as possible. Uh, the objectives today are really to touch on the CEIP and uh, provide an update of Pacific Power's position in that process, as well as deepen an understanding of how the IRP is used to develop the CEIP, um, the interim and specific targets that are included, and the CBIs and engagement as well. Um, throughout the presentation, you'll also see um, updates on how it was included in the biennial update. So a lot of great information coming in for you and looking forward to hearing from you all. Next slide. So with that, I think I will hand it over to Matt McVie to jump into the meet. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Matt McVie. I'm Vice President of Regulatory Policy and Operations for Pacific Corp. And I'd like to give a little bit of a kind of background overview of you know, where we are with the CEIP. So if we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so I want to start for those that may not be familiar with Pacific Corp, with providing a little background on who we are. So uh, Pacific Corp uh, serves just under 2 million customers across all of its service territory. So we serve customers in Idaho, Wyoming, and Utah under the trade name Rocky Mountain Power, and then 
customers in Washington, Oregon, and California under the trade name Pacific Power. Um, but we are one company serving all of those customers. In Washington, we serve approximately 137 thousand customers, uh, primarily in the South Central and Southeast um, portions of the state, Walla Walla, Yakima area. Um, and, you know, we have historically a, a more diverse um, customer base than statewide. Um, so, you know, there's, a, you know, relative for uh, Speaking other languages other than English at home, it's 33% versus statewide and 19%. So, um, you know, we are kind of working in in areas that are not, it's not Puget Sound, um, you know, it's not Spokane. And, you know, we're trying to, to tailor to our, our groups in those areas. So next slide, please. So Pacific War, given that, that range, um, you know, one of the, the strengths when most people look at that and look at that we're serving six states, um, you know, it can be pretty complicated and we are a complicated utility um, when you start, you know, interacting with us when we start to talk about rate making, um, we admit that. Um, but we also believe that there's a lot of advantages to that. The geographic diversity and the load diversity allows us to uh, locate resources in the best possible places. So we can get uh, Wyoming wind, which has a, a higher capacity factor than most other areas. Uh, we can get access to um, solar in Utah, which will have higher capacity factor than other areas. What that means is that energy is generally more of uh, more available to use for our customers. Um, and then that is generally lower cost also. Um, you know, any renewable resource, once that energy is flowing out of the system, it's low cost. And that allows us to decarbonize our grid and do it in a more affordable way because we're going to get more from those resources. Um, so for, with, with that comes a substantial transmission system. And the transmission system not only allows us to integrate all of those resources from those different areas, so we can get use hydro, we can use wind from the Columbia River Gorge, wind from Wyoming, solar from Utah, um, but it also allows us to get access to markets. Uh, and you know, Pacific Ore is, you know, one of the the leaders trying to drive the expansion of markets because we also believe that allows for even broader integration across not just. Um, within Pacific Core system, but across multiple systems in the West, uh, you know, getting that that broader market um, working is going to help not only reduce costs for our customers, but integrate more renewables. Uh, and then in Washington, we have a lot of programs to offset the cost of electricity. Um, you know, we were one of the first movers to create a low-income discount program. Um, you know, other utilities followed, and that is, you know, one of the issues that we're discussing in our current rate case is you know, what happens with that program. So uh, next slide, please. So what is CETA? I'm sure everyone kind of glanced through um, those that introduced themselves. I think everyone's fairly familiar with CETA, but if anyone isn't, you know, the goal of the Clean Energy Transformation Act in Washington is to move towards um, serving our customers with 100 you know, with energy generated from renewable and non-emitting resources by 2045. And so the idea is to have 100% of the, the energy generated from those resources to serve the customers. Um, you know, as we transition, um, we're also becoming more mindful of the equity distribution of benefits. You know, one of the big changes with CETA, we also saw it in, um, in Oregon with House Bill 2021, is that there's a little bit of a, a change. We're, we're, um, need to be more focused on the communities and building up and then making sure that there's kind of that equitable, equitable distribution of benefits, but then just equity in general. You know, that is, it's a new consideration for us to look at. Um, utilities have historically been least cost, least risk. You know, it's very, uh, you do the analysis and you can identify, you know, how you, you know, what's the best resource by simplifying the calculation to numbers. And now we're starting to look at other components to it. Um, you know, that is something that it's going to take some time to try to build that in and figure out where that goes, how that fits into every component. But that is, um, it's a priority for the utility. And we talk about that uh, a little bit later. Um, Kimberly Alejandro is going to be discussing that. Um, and then as part of that, each utility has to file the Clean Energy Action Plan and the Clean Energy Implementation Plan. Next slide, please. 
So a couple of the, the CETA targets. Um, by the end of 2025, we have to remove coal resources from the allocation of electricity. Um, this is uh, it is an issue for Pacific Corp. We do have, um, we serve customers in Washington um, from two coal facilities right now, Coal Strip in Montana, um, which is the other um, two major IOUs in electric IOUs in Washington also have um, an ownership interest in Coal Strip. And so we're working with multiple parties there. Uh, I believe that there's six owners, Puget, um, Avista, Pacific Corp, uh, Portland General Electric, um, actually there's more than that, and Northwestern, and then um, the kind of private uh, developer owner, Talon, uh, for that one. Uh, but then we also um, own, along with Idaho Power, Jim Bridger um, units one through four, so there's four units in one facility. Uh, and that facility is actually transitioning to, to gas, but um, that is one of the those are two resources that we need to plan to exit by 2025. Um, beginning in 2030, the goal is to be um, greenhouse gas neutral. So uh, the idea is at least 80% is uh, of the electricity used to serve Washington customers is generated from renewables or non-emitting. Um, but if we still have some emissions coming from the other 20%, we offset that um, with renewable e energy credits. And you know, so to work towards that neutrality, with the ultimate goal being in 2045 to ensure that um, all of our customers, all of their energy usage is served by renewable resources or non-emitting resources. Next slide, please. So where are we in the CEIP approval process? So we filed our CEIP in December, 2021. Um, we filed a revised in March this, uh, this year. Um, you know, we received stakeholder comments on that. It's going through a proceeding at the Washington Utilities and Transportation Commission. Um, we have been in settlement discussions with parties in that proceeding. So those are the interveners that have uh, kind of submitted their request to intervene in the proceeding. And those parties have recently requested that the um, schedule for that proceeding um, be put on hold. So uh, all of the parties have gotten to the point where we think that a settlement is possible. So we wanted to put the adjudicated proceeding essentially on hold as, to give us time to finalize the settlement and then file it. So uh, Pacific Core is uh, very excited about that. We're glad we can get to a, a kind of stipulated resolution on that where we, we reach some agreement. Um, it'll include some conditions, much like what we saw in the other proceedings um, for the other utilities. And, you know, we can then start moving forward with the plan. Um, there will be some, there's still going to be a commission decision that comes out. So it's up to the parties to show the commission that the um, stipulation, the agreement of the parties that reached the the settlement, that that is still in the public interest. So there's um, going to be an ongoing process. The commission um, will have to make a determin on, determination on that. But the, um, the procedural schedule is suspended at this point. And so we're very hopeful that we can reach a resolution and start implementing the agreed upon conditions and move forward with a clean energy implementation plan. Next slide, please. So. For those that want to participate, but um, may not already be an intervener or want to go through the process of being an intervener, the commission will be holding a um, public input meeting or public comment hearings. Uh, and that on the clean e energy implementation plan that is currently scheduled for September 28th um, at 6 p.m. So they, these are run by the utility commission. And so if there's any change to that, I just encourage everyone to um, look forward to that. But this is what uh, the time and date that we are noticing for it. So it should be set, but you know, there's, it's always subject to change. Um, you know, weather events could always change it. So just you know, please continue to monitor the, the Washington Utility and Transportation Commission website. But that's the time for the public comment hearing. Um, now, just for reference, Pacific Corps also has a general rate case. Um, we want to get the word out on that also. And so we've, we've included on this slide the um, public comment hearing date for our general rate case. So just wanted to include that full transparency about that. And we encourage 
um, everyone to participate and, and listen in or provide public comments. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide. And what I'd like to do is kind of use this to introduce some of the, the discussion that will happen a little bit later. But you know, one, Pacific Core filed its biennial update or will be filing its biennial update um, on the CEIP in November. So we filed in 2021. So we have um, 2021, 2020, uh, sorry, 2022, um, 2023. And then the, the four year period for the CEIP includes 2024 and 2025. Now, um, with that original filing in 2021, it was based on our 2021 integrated resource plan or IRP. Um, Pacific Core's update uh, consistent with its March 2023 CEIP or Clean Energy Implementation Plan refiling, um, adjust the targets uh, to address our 2023 IRP. And this is where, if you're not familiar with the complexity of, of Pacific Corp, we do uh, IRPs on a two-year basis. We, we revise our resource plans our forward-looking 20-year um, integrated resource plans on a two-year basis. For Washington, um, Washington only mandates a uh, four-year IRP with you know, every other year, or sorry, every two years we file an update. Um, so we did have a new IRP. Um, you know, we did file that with the, the you know, that update uh, with the commission. Um, and then what we identified was several change factors from the 2021 IRP and the original CEIP. And I think they're just important to note. One was, and I'm gonna highlight you know, three of those factors because it, it kind of shows what we're dealing with with the change in industry. Um, but the first one was as a multi-state utility, and this is common for all multi-state utilities, they, uh, you have to figure out how you're going to allocate shared costs um, among your customers in your in your various states. So Pacific Core has been doing this for a long time. We've been a multi-state utility since uh, I believe the 1960s. Um, started with you know Pacific Core um, serving California, Oregon, Washington, Montana, and Wyoming, um, and then there was a merger with Utah Power in 1989, and so we added different parts of um, uh, Wyoming, Idaho, and Utah at that point. We've always had to allocate the cost because we'll have transmission system generation that's common and used to serve all of our customers. In 2020, we had an allocation methodology that we had um, an agreement on and we filed and commissions approved. And it had planned for us to have a new allocation methodology um, starting in 2024. Uh, we didn't get there. The idea for that plan was that as states went into kind of a needed new resources, they would essentially be a, a assigned the costs and benefits of the resources that um, matched that need. And so they would be assigned more costs or benefits. As we've gone through discussions with um, you know, parties that signed that agreement that originally kind of contemplated that organization, some issues came up with that and we started to identify that maybe some other alternatives might be better. So we're, those negotiations are continuing. And so um, in a number of our states, we've gotten extensions of the current allocation methodology that goes through the end of 2025. And so we're continuing to negotiate that. Um, but that did affect our forecasting because we were expecting to have more of an allocation of each one of those resources um, being used to serve Washington customers. And now essentially we're kind of going back. The assumption is what we have now, which is Washington gets about 8% of all of our non-emitting resources to serve its load. So we're working with a changed assumption for the allocation methodology. Um, the second impact is the energy markets have stayed, um, the cost for energy have stayed high. Um, we have historically tried to keep that very low. But what we found in the rate case that is currently pending before the commission is as we were preparing that rate case, we were looking at forecasts of net power costs. And we were looking at the timing of retiring our coal strip 
and Jim Bridger facilities, so the, the coal facilities, we are looking at potentially retiring them early. Um, this was part of our prior rate case that was filed in um, 20, well, was litigated in 2020. Um, but when we, we reached the settlement in that case and we um, specifically, um, both Pacific Core and staff identified that there was some flexibility that was built in um, that would allow us to continue to operate those resources if beyond 2023, if it was in the interest of customers. And we found that that actually came um, to fruition. Uh, unfortunately, with the high energy market prices in that in our current rate case, Pacific Core has identified that we save customers 72 million annually by continuing to operate Jim Bridger and Coal Strip for the benefit of the Washington customers up until the CETA deadline. And so um, while with two of the units in Bridger, we're gonna be converting those to gas, we still have two that are coal. And so that unfortunately also means fewer, uh, more emissions coming from those um, during the last two years of our, our CEIP, but at a much lower cost for our customers. And so we're trying to main, mitigate some of the cost pressures that we're seeing. And then finally, we did run into some issues with our um, 2020 all source um, request for proposals. So this is the request for proposals is how we go out and try to procure agreements. Um, we're comparing the market um, through power purchase agreements from third parties versus um, potential resources that are company owned. Um, what we found is that due to um, and if the, the effects of the COVID pandemic, um, we were seeing supply chain issues and we got uh, a lot, almost all of the bids that we received um, ended up getting requests for repricing, which means that the initial price that was submitted got changed later on. Um, that resulted in fewer than expected new resources um, scheduled to co come online in 2024, 2025. Um, in essence, we didn't sign the power purchase agreements from third parties that we expected that we would be able to because the prices started to change. Um, and you know, we were moving into another RFP, moving into that other RFP when we've got changes in prices, we couldn't evaluate um, whether those prices were right or not, because the price changes came you know, late in that process. And so essentially we would have had to open up the RFP and find other resources, um, allow report resources to reprice. We had a new RFP right around the corner. So we just ended up with a little bit of delay in getting new resources. Now, all of that being said, that doesn't change the trajectory. You know, Pacific Core has been decarbonizing and you know, since I mean, I mean, primarily since 2017, but we've actually been moving pretty quickly um, from um, well, when I started in 2005, um, we started to uh, build and buy a substantial amount of wind generation back then. Um, but it did mean for this initial CIP, those first four years, we haven't been able to get the targets that we initial, initially contemplated at the end of 2021. So with that, I don't know if there's any questions, but I'd like to move on to the next section. And this, is, this will be discussed, some of the actual kind of interim and specific targets of the CIP will be discussed later in the presentation. Thank you, Matt. All right. We'll, we'll give it a second to see if anyone raises their hand or drops something in the chat, but otherwise uh, very much appreciate that information. And we'll hand it off to Randy. Hi, uh, I hope everybody can see me and hear me okay. Uh, yes. This is Randy you. Baker. I'm Pacific Corps Director of Resource Planning. And I'd like to talk a bit about the relationship between our, our integrated resource plan and the clean energy implementation plan. Uh, so yeah, moving on to the, the, the first slide about the integrated resource planning. Um, one important note that emphasizes something that Matt said a few moments ago is that the 2023 integrated resource plan um, was filed in the state of Washington as its two-year progress report to the 2021 IRP. And the reason for that is exactly as Matt explained that 
Um, our normal cadence as a company is to create an integrated resource plan every two years. Washington requires every four, but we did have this two-year progress report that was due. And virtually all of the requirements of the two-year progress report are encapsulated in our two-year cycle IRP. So if you hear me talking about the 2023 IRP or the two-year progress report, um, just recognize that those are really the same thing. And in actuality, the integrated resource plan includes a lot more information and updates a lot more data. Um, so it actually goes a step beyond what would have been strictly required for the two-year progress report. Um, so in that 2023 IRP, uh, the entirety of Appendix O addresses Washington-specific elements, highlights updates, uh, related to the CEIP, CETA, the biennial CEIP update, all things CETA. Um, and in addition to that, um, throughout the IRP document itself, outside of Appendix O, uh, you know, there are a number of data points, um, studies, uh, and chapters eight and nine, for example, that we run specifically for Washington that um, would not be there, but for Washington's influence on our entire process. The 2023 IRP was developed using the Plexos long-term or LT planning model, the medium-term MT schedule, another model, and the short-term ST model. All three of those are part of the Plexos suite of tools, which uses some pretty advanced mathematics to optimally develop a range of least cost least risk portfolios. Let me pause and unpack that a little bit just for clarity. So the objective of this mathematical model is to solve a problem and it's supposed to solve it in the way that creates the least cost and includes the least risk. And that cost and risk um, ultimately impacts customers and how reliable the system is, how safe electricity is and the costs of paying for that power. Um, that word portfolio is very important because when we say a least cost, least risk portfolio, portfolio is what we use to describe the set of resources, transmission investments, retirement assumptions of um, units that are um, aging out or being removed for other reasons. It's all of those um, new decisions that the model is calculating. And we describe that as a portfolio. Um, and then the second part of this phrase, under various policy and cost environments, and this is delineated a little further below, um, we have what we call price-policy scenarios. Price refers to natural gas price influences on how much uh, energy costs out there in the world. And that policy piece of price-policy scenario refers to um, what we model as a proxy for future policies that may come into effect. They could be federal, they could be state, they could look like a lot of different things, but in all cases, that, um, that uh, policy part of these scenarios is intended to represent the overall trend toward decarbonizing. And um, as you may know, we have had recent significant legislation and new rules coming from the federal government. Um, CETA and the CEIP itself um, would have been part of that uh, future estimation in years prior to it actually becoming realized. Um, Oregon has its own clean energy plan happening. And so in our expected case assumptions, the way that we anticipate the world will unfold, um, we assume what we refer to as a a medium CO2 price assumption. And that means, really what that means is that we, we anticipate that trend is going to continue. And we attempt to account for it uh, based on a survey of expected CO2 prices that we roll into our model. Uh, so looking at the bullets um, below for price policy scenarios, we model a low, medium, and high natural gas price which is a driver for uh, market prices. We model uh, zero, medium, and high CO2 prices. That's the policy side I was just talking about. 
And for those two elements, our expected case, the way that we think the future is most likely to unfold, is represented as the medium natural gas and the medium CO2 price. Uh, we also model an additional scenario that includes the social cost of greenhouse gases as required uh, by Washington's legislation. Uh, and I'll note that prior to CETA, um, Pacificor did model a social cost of greenhouse gases assumption and in anticipation of CETA and similar legislation, um, but we calculated it differently. And along with CETA came a very specific requirement for what the social cost of greenhouse gases um, price adder should look like. Um, and so in the discussion to follow wherever you see the SC abbreviation, that's a reference to the social cost of greenhouse gases that we modeled. The Clean Energy Implementation Plan is informed by the IRP portfolio developed under the SC GHG price policy scenario and is developed to meet the requirements of the rules. And so where you see SCGHG, that's just the long form of social cost of greenhouse gases. Um, in some of our abbreviations, it's just SC, as you'll see below. Um, and so looking, and in fact, in the very next bullet, P-SC is simply our abbreviation internally. And we also use this to designate the names of cases in the IRP document. But that's an abbreviation that simply stands for portfolio. That's the P-SC, meaning that it was run under the social cost of greenhouse gas assumptions. And so that's the portfolio optimi op excuse me, optimized under a future, assuming that that cost is, is realized in a way that impacts portfolio development and ultimately operations. The W10 CETA portfolio was created as a CETA compliant portfolio that layered in additional incremental renewable resources for Washington customers on top of the PSC case in order to meet the interim compliance targets in 2030 through 2045. What that means is that if you simply take all of our inputs for Pacific War and optimize a portfolio, assuming the social cost of greenhouse gases as the, uh, as the, as the scenario, the policy scenario, you don't quite get an answer that is 100% meeting C to targets. It's close, it's extremely close, but it doesn't quite get you there. And so the W10 CETA case was developed in recognition of that small gap. And um, you'll see how we filled that gap on a later slide. Next slide, please. Um, this diagram is kind of new. Uh, it was just developed for this presentation. Um, hope, hopefully we'll be seeing more of it, but it might be refined as we go. Uh, but the intent here is to really explain how the IRP and IRP updates relate to the CEIP and the CETA compliant um, portfolios. And if you look at that larger top bubble that's labeled Plexos portfolios, you'll see that it has two sub bubbles inside it. On the left, we have the Plexos portfolio for the clean, in, clean Energy Implementation Plan. And on the right, we have the Plexos portfolio for the system-wide IRP. So in the 2023 IRP, AKA the, uh, the two-year progress report, uh, we developed both of those. We have a CEIP portfolio, the W10. We have a system-wide IRP portfolio for all of our states that's developed under the expected case scenarios. Um, and we intend to uh, perform those two functions and create those portfolios whenever we have an IRP or an IRP update or a CEIP update. Um, you know, those will go hand in hand as we move forward through time and insert new inputs and update our understanding and refine our analysis. Uh, both of those flow into that next larger bubble down in the middle, the request for proposals. And uh, Matt talked about this a little bit as well, but um, let me just explain how our portfolios interact with the request for proposals, recognizing that this is a very high level view uh, of a process that's got a lot of pieces. 
But starting at the left inside the request for proposals bubble, um, we collect market bids. So on the basis of analysis that we've run in the bubble above, we've got portfolios that are suggesting this is what we would do in an ideal world. These are the kinds of resources we would need. Uh, this is the amount of resources we would need. These are the locations where they would best fit. Uh, and so all of that is part of the long-term 20-year forecast that is an IRP. We collect market bids essentially using those portfolios to signal the market as to what we're interested in. We invite them to bid into our RFP, and that leads to a process where we do updated, refreshed modeling with bid information. And at this point, the inputs are from actual projects. And the model makes initial selections. And we run an SC case for the CEIP, and we run an expected case for the IRP. Those initial selections uh, result in uh, a price scoring evaluation. Um, and if you're not familiar with price scoring, it's a component of the request for proposals to demonstrate how the different projects um, compare to each other in terms of value. Um, and the results of these analyses result in what we call a final short list, which is a list of bids that we intend to, uh, to pursue and, and sign contracts with to the extent that we can. Um, and then as we move down into that lower box allocations and procurement, you know, that's where several important things happen. Um, you know, one of them is finishing the contracting that I just meant, mentioned and procuring the actual resources that have been bid in and that we've identified, um, but also allocations. And this is a significant point because there are other processes that affect not just which resources we may procure and operate on behalf of customers, but really, um, you know, which states, which customers use uh, which resources and what they ultimately get charged for. And so uh, also a very important piece of the process. Once resources have been procured and implemented and become part of the system, that uh, large arrow to the left that loops back up to the top indicates that those now become new inputs that serve as part of the baseline for the next set of analyses that we would perform. But instead of being optional resources for the model to choose from, the ones that we've actually procured uh, become existing resources that are uh, just assumed to exist. Um, one other thing I'll note about this diagram is at each stage, you can see over to the right, we've got this bubble that says evaluate C to targets. At each stage, whether we're developing portfolios, um, operating a request for proposals, allocating and, and going through procurement, you know, at each stage, we're interested in uh, how we are meeting C to targets. Are we on target? Are the trends changing? Is there something we need to do to course correct? Um, you know, does everything look great in terms of meeting those, those standards? Uh, so that's happening throughout the process. And obviously, depending on the results of these different stages, um, the C to targets can change. Next slide, please. Uh, here on this slide, we take a little narrower focus to the development of a CETA compliant portfolio. So in the, in the slide above, this would be at any stage where we are creating new portfolios. Um, if we're looking at the CEIP portfolio for CETA compliance, this slide speaks specifically to that. Uh, so starting over on the top left with that box number one, we develop a system-wide portfolio for all the states that is optimi optimized with the social cost of greenhouse gas price policy assumption. And so that meets uh, Washington's requirement to uh, develop and assess our portfolios with that assumption. In step two, um, we take a look at uh, Washington allocated generation outcomes relative to the CETA targets and goals to determine whether they have been met by that portfolio. 
In the uh, third step for final CETA compliance, we identify uh, any shortfalls and then we proceed to address those shortfalls and determine what all needs to be done about it. And in the 2023 IRP slash uh, two-year progress report, we labeled that case the W10 CETA portfolio. Um, so looking down toward the bottom, on the left, you start with the PSC case. On the right, you end up with the W10 CETA compliant case. Uh, and that's the way that we tie these together and make sure that we have met all of the requirements in developing those resource portfolios. Next slide, please. Uh, here we have a look at the at integrated resource planning and the CIP from the perspective of where did we end up? And this graph shows you the results of the W10 CETA system-wide portfolio. Uh, so we got a lot of colors here and a lot of different things happening, but, but essentially what this does is as you go through each year of the 20 year plan, you can look at the corresponding uh, column of data and get an idea of what kinds of resources are being added to the system um, per the W10 CETA compliant case. And a couple of things that stand out, if you look toward the bottom left, you can see uh, the black that's down toward the bottom uh, and the purple that is rep uh, that which represents coal and the darker purple which represents um, natural gas generating resources. And you can see that um, the, the black coal is fading off over time. And you can also see that as time goes on, particularly the amount of wind resources is increasing and becomes um, takes a significant jump, for example, in the year 2032, and then builds to its uh, highest levels as time goes on. You can also see increases in energy efficiency as time goes on and in demand response, but this gives an idea of the trend. Uh, overall, what is the uh, system doing in our pursuit of CETA targets? I also would call out that the scale of this, uh, which will become interesting in just a moment, the scale of these additions, um, I think it peaks out at close to 45,000 of installed megawatts. That's the nameplate capacity of a generating unit. And it's a lot, there's a huge number. If we turn to the next slide, here you can see the um, that step three incremental addition that we needed to make to achieve our final CETA targets. In other words, um, once you apply the SC price policy scenario, uh, you end up with, um, uh, let's see, so incremental resource additions for Washington customers to meet CETA compliance targets based on PSC. So if you just run the system with the social cost of greenhouse gases and then ask, how do we meet the 2030 target for CETA compliance? The answer is you darn near meet it. Just under 250 megawatts of resources are needed to be added, uh, which relative to the 45,000 we saw in the prior slide is not very much, much at all. Um, and so the, the trending is already taking us there. And you'll see that it's a split of uh, solar and wind resource. Next slide, please. 